What is going on fellow Mulligan golfers? Got a little more of a casual golf video here, a little more of a breakdown of things, how it, how I actually do the things, how this channel runs. Um, so I've been getting a lot of questions on how I film my golf videos, what I actually do, how does that pipeline work and the workflow look like when I bring the footage back. So I thought it'd be a good video to just break down what actually goes down. So let's just jump into it. All right, so first, um, usually what I do is I usually start the project, create the folder. So I've already created the folder here. Uh, I do a lot of copy and pasting. Uh, I duplicate a lot of stuff from previous projects because not too much changes yet. Uh, the videos that I'm doing now have a similar format as they can continue to keep going. So I've been able to create like this sort of seamless pipeline that works for both like content that I'm incorporating into the cut, the footage itself, and then just getting through it. And you'll see as I get to it. So first things first, we create the folder. Uh, I usually use my labeling convention. Everybody has their own, so figure out what works for you. Uh, and then I dump the footage across first thing. So I got all the GoPro footage here from the day that I got to play Yoshidihi, which is a beautiful course. If you've ever out there, check it out. Uh, I don't recommend going to the casino because it's way too smoky, but the golf course is beautiful and it was a lot of fun. Um, so then that's usually what I'll do is I'll get the footage on there first, get the folder started. Then my second thing that I would do is I'd scan the scorecard. So yes, I actually physically write it down. I feel like it's a good asset to have inside of the video. Uh, and people get to see different uh, something than other than just a digital scorecard. So I usually scan that in. And then once I scan that in, I usually open that guy up and then I'll usually Photoshop him and, uh, and kind of just clean it up because I usually score what I score there and I usually just try to clean it up as much as possible and uh, I'll show you what I do and what I'm trying to do is just trying to create like a, a blank slate for the top part and so you can see like um, I know that I want to cover all that up right so I just bring this guy up and just try to match it as much as possible and you have a pretty good cover right so there you go and then I can reveal it to show my score if I need to but I actually have the physical scorecard in front of me so I don't really need the digital version too much so what I'm doing is just kind of cleaning it up just so it looks decent and like um, it fits the video font or like format and stuff like that. So canvas size. So that's why. So it's 1920 by 1080. See, I make mistakes. I can't, I can't do this shit by myself. You know, these programs remind me constantly what I mis mistakenly do. So, but here you go. See, now most of the time I usually have a lot of gap on the left like this because of the aspect ratio for video. Uh, these scorecards usually never fit. So what I end up usually doing is taking like a title card. Let me just open this up, flip it real quick, safe get out of there is I usually just take the title something that I can just kind of flop onto there on the side of it that'll make it look good uh, I myself don't really like this and I'm not comfortable with it so what I thought of while things were importing is if I take this guy and I bring this back over here and just rotate this over and I'm just gonna take this guy right here and just keep him like that right and instead then that way it doesn't look so weird with those white gaps everywhere at the top and bottom this way i can just kind of cut let's rasterize layer and let's just do this and yeah, everything else let's delete it out bring the opacity up and see with this i think i'll have a little bit of easier time clone stamping that shit out right so if I just highlight this whole brick itself so it doesn't go outside of anything I can take that line out and, and just clean up stuff really fast so that I can have a cleaner image and that way if I bring this guy up right and just kind of center it off Bring it back a little more so it's not cutting off that thing then what I can do is let's bring this guy I just want to clean this up a little just so I don't see that white speck there and now I'm spending a lot on this but I figured I'm showing you guys what YouTube what and showing you to what I'm doing might as well try to be as precise as I can I'm not doing it too clean but it's 
you get the concept of how much you can do to this just to clean stuff up so what i'm going to do is take this top corner right here and i'm just going to duplicate the and oops flip horizontal and we'll send that to the back behind that and we're just going to do this bring it to the front yeah i know i'm doing this the wrong way it's just because i'm recording myself and that's why i'm trying to like get through it fast and so what we can do is this is the title let's just add a little bit of a fade so it doesn't harshly come across right and there you go see now i have something that sits a little better on this side that's not so weird looking than those white squares so let's save that let's get out of here and let's get back to the regular project it was something that was on my mind before i wanted to move forward so now what we go back after we've done that now what i'm going to do is actually copy over the other remaining elements from a previous project so you can see right here i have uh, the last two sets of videos that i have so what i'm going to do is i'm going to copy over everything other than the footage folder the image folder and the photoshop folder so what we do is we copy come back down to this folder and we paste and then we wait okay now that we've gotten everything copied over um I, there's a reason why i do that it's because when i open this premiere file this in this new project it's going to relink everything from the previous project and like i said not too much changes from cut to cut it's about footage and the content inside the graphics that are overlaid so it's very easy to kind of just go through and re-manipulate previous projects to fit a new project uh, so what i'm going to go in here just do a little bit of cleaning i'm going to delete all these old renders out because these are from a previous project i'm going to relabel these so i don't forget the which ones that we're working on so we're working on 65 and 66 and we delete these are the thumbnails that i use for instagram uh tiktok and youtube so I've also templatized those thumbnails as well. So at the, uh, at the end of the video, I'm gonna show you all the templated stuff that I've actually created for these. So it helps me kind of streamline this workflow. Um, oops, let's go back into the project again. Uh, let's delete out all the tracers, which we'll get to as well. Let's turn this volume down a little bit get those out and and then i know i'm not going to be using these because these are custom graphics that went into that actual video which i usually do a lot i try to add in as much um customization to the videos as much as possible and so that's kind of cleaning it up there uh, now that we have everything kind of set now we can relabel this youtube project for the premiere and this is going to be for 31 and 32 and i'm going to go ahead and open this premiere project and now we're going to start the fun stuff so let's get in here and i can kind of show you how the rest of this work cut is going to work because of time i'm only going to do one video which is going to be like nine holes but pretty much what you're going to see for what i treat to that nine is what i do for the rest of the whole video and i just continue it through i don't separate the two videos when i'm editing i knock it all out through so what you see as a process i finish usually each stage before i move to the next one um, so with this here, so now you see we got a lot of extra stuff from the previous project So now what I do is I take some time to clean it up so that it matches to the current project and a great thing that I do Is I actually script out a lot of my stuff So as you can tell I kind of templatize word documents so that I could keep track of all the metadata and stuff that I incorporate with to the videos It also helps when I copy and paste this stuff onto other social platforms because I really have all the description and everything labeled out so now what I'll do is actually open up the right document which is showing you the wrong one this is a script for this video but if i open up the document for this one it's going to show me how to relabel all like the video files that i need and as well as um show me like the description that i want to put on youtube and stuff like that so let's go ahead and do that before i forget let me just open up to then <laughs> here's the actual doc for the yoshidi golf course so what i do is i just copy and paste this guy and i know that that's the lowest number is the front nine always and the highest number is the back nine so then i copy and paste this guy and i think i have yoshidi he spelled wrong and i do it's yoga i don't even know how to pronounce it but i don't know if i'm pronouncing it right but it's it's yo it's i don't know if it's yosha or yoka yoka or i don't know if you know comment below let me know if i'm 
pronouncing it wrong or right but there you go now i have the two cuts labeled as i need so i'm going to move this first cut to the front and that way i can play with a little more organization and then bring this gopro folder here so here's what a good a good way to organize your footage and stay current to what you have is now i'm going to go and delete out all the gopro footage that i have because it's from a previous project so now it takes off all the unnecessary footage off of these timelines too so now i can have everything come back in and it, when the footage comes in it's a clean timeline with just the content on the top that needs to be so even with the motion graphics i'll take away all these tracers because they're irrelevant because they're tracers for old footage in a different course so non-relevant so i'm taking even more stuff off of the timeline all the extra graphics that i added onto the cut just to help guide the video through we can take those out too so now it brings me to a good pausing point to now where i'll switch to after effects to bring in the scorecard, edit the scorecard down, get those two videos done so I can come back in and just concentrate on being in Premiere. So let's go ahead and do that. We open up After Effects. So as previously mentioned, when I saved the scorecard PSD for a reason with that, with that same naming convention is when I open up this After Effects project, it's gonna ask me, uh, let's move to single screen so you guys can see what I'm doing. It's, it's, it might recognize and it might not recognize where the uh, actual scorecards are. But I'm gonna show you why I do that. So let's open up front nine. And let's open up front nine. And let's open up back nine. See, yeah, see it already replaced it. So it knew. So that's the reason why I copy and paste things over because it, 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 it'll recognize in that same folder structure. Oh, okay. I was using scorecard PSD from this folder. As long as I keep my folder structure the same throughout each project, everything should open up and link like it should. So now I'm just plugging and playing. See, so now I have the back nine scorecard, front nine scorecard here. And now all I gotta kinda do is just reposition a lot of this stuff so that it fits into this scorecard. So what I normally do is just take all this stuff, move it. I don't know why it's not letting me move there. There you go. And what I usually do is I take the middle of, of like the the for the name part i take like the middle of the scorecard i'll leave that there that seems to be working fairly well i'll move the numbers over and with this sometimes it's a hit or miss sometimes i need to go in and realign shit and like take out all the spacings and do stuff like that because some scorecards are aligned a lot differently than others so sometimes it does take a little bit more work to get back to the positions that the numbers need to be in the scorecard so every project's a different use case so i mean we're doing this much work at this point so it, it's not really going to take that much more time but sometimes you can get get away with doing it like that see like i've reached the max point where i can put as much letting in between each numbers so now uh, the best thing to do is just jump it down and i just do tab and i just space bar to where i think it fits and yeah, it's not like the most ideal thing to do, but it's the the numbers and the content is big enough to see where it's not gonna take you that long. It is time consuming and it's kind of annoying, but it helps, right? It gives the visuals to the person that wants to play the scorecard, like wants to play the course. And, you know, I'm trying to incorporate as much as I can from the courses that I get, because I know when I first started this channel, that was the whole reason why I started is because I was researching courses out here in the East Bay and I wasn't finding any YouTube videos other than people's drones footage. So that's the reason why I started it. So let's continue. So now you can see I leave all the animations on there. So it's pretty much just moving sh moving stuff around and re-altering it so it fits the numbers. So now I would just come in and go in individually and redo the numbers. <laughs> And the weird thing about this one is um, this course, I actually started on back nine. So the first set of holes that I do in the morning were actually the back nine. And the last set of nine that I ended up with was the front nine. So it's a, it's it's weird because when I come into editing, I sometimes forget when I do the intros on the course. Like, oh, shit. Yeah, we're playing the back nine. That's first, not the front nine. So that's often the something that usually happens. And, you know, just to save time so I don't have to reposition and redo all this at like all the um, numbers and stuff like that. I usually just take all this stuff out and I'll delete it. And then I'll just copy and paste all this guy back over to here. 
Um, so I know with these, we don't need those animated, so I can take the animation off of those and bring the paths back up to here so we can start. And what's going to happen is I'm going to animate the information that's for the back nine now. So what we can do is toggle down. We need these three layers and we're going to duplicate, bring that to the top and slide it across. And you know, sometimes it matches, sometimes it doesn't match. Uh, I mean, it's not, it's like a hit or miss most of the time. So um, I forgot to add this up for this front nine. I think I sh don't ever put the final number in. So let's just calculate it. Four plus six plus six plus four plus five plus four, seven plus four plus three plus five. So we shot a 44. So we we're plus eight. Very nice. So take that same information, let's do 44 and plus eight. But with this, we haven't done the adjusting of these numbers. So let's go in and And there's that and let's get back to calculator. I don't know why this app always closes out on its own. It's so weird. So we have five, nope. That's a six. We got six plus four plus five plus four plus four plus five plus five plus six plus six. So we got 45 on the back, which would bring us to plus nine. And then that I know these are going to animate, right? So what I usually do is about a second out onto this one. I'll bring these three elements out to here so I know which layer it is and then hit option T and drag out to 10 frames hit option T again bring these down and then just put a nice little ease in on these and you're set right and then you just got to offset these two so that it comes on a little later right so we have the focus is first on the final score and then what you shot like proactively compared to that and then maybe like Two seconds later, I'll duplicate those three layers again, bring those out, bring that to that starting point there, twirl down its keyframes, come back down, and then I'll move these over and show like the final final score. You know what I shot throughout both, which was 89, so 17. Ooh. Too bad <laughs> too good but that's usually my game um, I'm, I'm usually playing around like that like 80 to 9 85 to 90 marker most of the time so let's go ahead and export these uh, I'll export these as mp4 so they're ready to go in the motion graphics folder for the project and uh, once we get a media encoder up and going kind of show you how it goes from there so now what we're going to do is we're going to troll down to the project, go back into motion graphics. I already have these MP4s here. That's a reason why, because it'll automatically correlate back to Premiere and it should update. doesn't always work. It's not always a guarantee, but it's a great way for you to remember the steps that you need to take to get all the stuff done so you can incorporate it into your cut. So I will do the same thing for back nine, get that into the media encoder and, uh, get him into the right folder so they can export and yes let's replace because that's what we want to do and for the meantime we are now done with after effects now we will be moving into premiere to actually get all the footage cut down from the gopro and to get it all onto the timeline or the appropriate timeline let's close out that let's go back into premiere and let's see if it actually updated the scorecard and it did not see sometimes it's a hit or miss so let's go right here to scorecard yeah there it is replace footage sometimes i brain fart when i'm trying to do things really fast on this and so let's go down twirl motion graphics and we're doing front nine first and let's reconnect that one and then there you go replace footage do the same thing come back down to motion graphics and let's do back nine and so that way, the reason why I do a lot of this replacing stuff is it's already placed out. A lot of the time, the way you play, a lot of the courses out here, they're built the same. You know, start part four, part four, part five, part three. The, the, the schematics of a lot of them are the same. So the editing starts to become a little bit same too. So that's why I keep a lot of this stuff copy and paste because the format that I'm doing, my golf videos for now, 
it works because it's get them out get them done get them quick so let's jump into the rest of the gopro editing okay now that we've gotten all like the housekeeping stuff out of the way we got the scorecard in we got it all all got all the info that we need on the scorecard we got the premiere project ready to go i've even imported the footage because uh it takes a little bit to import and all the the transcoding that it takes so i thought i'd not waste time so here we have all the new footage and you see a gopro timeline right underneath it so what i'm gonna do is just drag all the gopro footage onto this timeline I'm gonna keep existing settings because I have this composition set to 1920 by 1080 just because it's easier to work in and GoPro footage isn't typically that rough to work with when you're coming to editing. But now we are gonna get into like the nitty gritty of the editing, uh, which is usually the fun part. So for the sake of this video, I'm only gonna show you what I usually do to one part of the video, which is gonna be nine. I usually break my videos up into two parts, front nine, back nine. But for this case, I had to start on the back nine for Yoshidihi. So we actually start in the morning on 10th and end our way on the 9th at the end of the day. So sometimes that makes for difficult editing only because sometimes when I'm on the course, I often forget Oh, I'm on the 8th and I'm thinking I'm only still playing the front nine and I'm actually two holes away from finishing my 18th. So sometimes I forget. I think on this one, I did a pretty good job on remembering, but if I didn't, forgive me. But that's the great part about post. I can mix and match everything so it wouldn't even know. You would just only be able to tell by daylight. So let's go into getting in, getting into editing. I took a lot of B-roll on this one because I knew that I wanted to get a little bit more of like the chorus because it's a beautiful chorus. It plays like a country club. So thought I'd try to incorporate as much as I can. This is a li little bit of pre-talking that I usually do. Um, depending on what I want to incorporate or not, I know from, my pre from remembering that I'm not going to use that clip because I talked too much and it was unnecessary talking. And then I ended up actually talking here which was a better setup for me to actually lead into the video um, uh, so this was right before i teed off so sometimes what i'll do is i'll throw the b-roll over it um, and then i usually do all that stuff in the main timeline once i start to get to like this part here and i start to actually copy and paste it onto the main timelines then i'll start adding in the b-roll and stuff on top of it but for for this timeline sake this is timeline just cutting down what exactly I'm going to use. So that's that's the purpose of this one. So I leave all the B-roll aside. Uh, in the first couple of videos when I first started this channel a year ago, you could see that I was doing VO. So I'd go there, film, just film whatever shots I got, then come back and do VO over it. A lot of the times I didn't get to edit until like two weeks later. So I'd often forget what, what was I playing, how was I shooting, what was my mentality. So now I started filming in a lot of the commentary while I'm actually playing. So then I can cut it into the cut. I don't have to do VO afterwards. So that's one aspect that I cut out of my post-production, which is a huge step when you're doing it. So um, let's just it cut out the intro and let's just get to like when we actually go to hit and I can show you basically what it what it entails. So here we go. Here's the 10th tee box playing as the first hole. Uh, the first one was a breakfast ball for me. You could tell scrub through. I went right into the woods on there on the left. It hit that tree and then you bounce right back. So I usually show this because this is why I'm called the mulligan golfer. So in, in reality, I would probably stop somewhere right here. So I give myself enough of a like head so I can put the graphics on top of it and the graphics can go away right before I swing. I know that I'm not going to need any more of this like footage. So I delete out all the footage that I don't use. So here we go. There's the first swing. And then it, as you know, I'll, I'll make some kind of comment or add some kind of funny thing in to get like to show the provisional and then I'll do the same thing again and I'll throw the graphics on top again just so people know I'm not a perfect golfer I actually I'm not nowhere anywhere near a perfect golfer but I like to put my mistakes in because then I ended up striping this drive and we had headwind against us so this thing barely carried like 200 yards um, and the wind is going to be very heavy throughout this cut so that's one thing I'm going to have to kind of play with as well in the commentary all you hear <laughs> sometimes so there's like 25 to 30 mile an hour wind this day, um, but the, the weather was gorgeous. So then I'll just like compensate for the tracer. So I want the tracer to end there. So there's the end of that cut, delete out, bring this clip closer towards me and see, so there's commentary, right? So this is the great part about not having to do VO. I'll explain everything that what I just shot. I hit my breakfast ball out. I did all this, I did that. Here comes my second shot. And so then I come down to the second shot. So then I come to the point where I think it's gonna have enough time to give me like my call out for shot to what my distance is to the hole and all that kind of stuff. 
um, in, in my first couple of videos, I was incorporating flags to the hole and all that kind of stuff too, which I should continue to do. And, you know, as maybe my videos start to increase in quality, I'll probably start to increase it in quality for content as well too. So right now I'm just kind of trying to get the channel to grow. Once I get that grow ship or the viewership, then I'll start putting a little more effort into like getting the actual content so that real golfers can look at my videos and be like hmm that was interesting so there we go we got that second shot right there cut out the rest of the footage that i don't need and same thing kind of happens sometimes here too so you end up kind of recording a lot more than you need to so then this is the great part about editing is that i can come in create the tail delete out what i don't want so then it jumps right into the second shot so i don't have too much lag time so you know people's attention span on videos is very short so you kind of want to leave out as much fluff as you don't need to have and so like a lot of this like hand holding waddling like it ended up rolling all the way down that back to that hill on behind that bunker so it was a bad shot but because the gopro shoots flat it's hard for me to zoom in and punch in and show like what actually happens later that further down the fairway because gopro's footage just shoots flat so what you're seeing here you're gonna see at 100 percent clarity anything blown up past that it's gonna start to get really pixelated so that's coming down the future hopefully better camera hopefully some help in filming too so i'm not the one controlling all the cameras and stuff like that so you see uh, maybe i'll stop it after my dance for making wanting it to stop rolling down the hill so here i am there's that next shot and i'll line it up right before i get onto the ball take a little bit out delete delete and scroll through kick that shot and it barely went up so i know when i start turning towards the camera that's the end of the shot and I don't usually trace a lot of these close shots because it's unnecessary um, if you could see it within the frame of the actual composition then you're okay um, and the same things goes for the putting I'm sorry about the lag on the computer I got a lot of things running at the same time right now so I don't usually have this much lag but it's usually pretty seamless but you catch the drift of what I usually do per hole and then I'll just continue to edit through and then there's the conclusion of the first hole right and cut that out and did i talk in between i did not so see sometimes i do commentate between holes sometimes i don't just because we're trying to get a move on and these courses out here in the east bay are really busy so what i generally do when i get to the second hole is i leave this gap here so i know that the, there's a gap between the first hole and the second hole and i've been doing so much of this editing i kind of have like an idea of where it goes so there you go there's that first hole cut down to where i can get onto the timeline so now i'll continue doing that through the rest of the holes for holes two and nine and then we'll come back in once i finish those out Now that we've finished cutting down the first portion of this, uh, the 18 holes, now that I've got this back nine cut down, uh, I did a little bit of reworking of the intro and the outro just because I had a little more to introduce with this course and I had a little more to talk about. Plus, I'm also starting to introduce the 10th hole in the second part of the video because most of the time it usually jumps right into the tee box. Uh, so now I'm trying to set up that second video a little more too, just kind of recapping stuff. So here we go. Here we got that first section. You can still see the gaps in between each of the holes. There's a reason why I'm doing that. And I'll explain to you at the end of this video why I'm doing that. So what we're going to do is we're going to copy this chunk right here. Again, keeping in mind, this is the back nine. So we are going to the back nine composition. And you can see this top layer pretty much has all the content graphics that were from the previous video. So basically these are all like the overlay graphics that go on to tell you what hole I'm hitting, what club I'm using, how far out I am and that kind of stuff. And you know, it's, it's recyclable because the content is always gonna be the same. It's just the info that just needs to change. So I go in and I readjust things, I measure it out to the new cut, and then I'll go in and re-implement the new information using this handy little scorecard. This is why I keep this. It comes in handy when, especially when you're doing cuts like this and stuff like that. So let's go ahead and copy and paste that footage in here. So you see, I have this highlighted and this highlighted because we have two layers of video that are coming in so I pushed everything up onto that third video layer up here and so let's zoom into this because I have the intro that plays so we want the video footage to start right here after this video after the uh, intro is pretty much gone so you can see that I cut down a lot of this uh, audio stuff too so let's go ahead and paste 
and I'm hitting the slash button underneath the delete key on a Mac keyboard to come back out to view the whole timeline in its zoom. So now, uh, now I get to play like the adjusting. Now I get to go in and delete stuff out, move things around so that it matches and so that I can continue to get this cut to a final render, right? So let's go in and get this fun stuff going. First thing I usually do is I take out this audio because the audio changes through every cut. I control the volume by increasing it and decreasing it throughout the cut as I find down points in the cut. So yeah, it's a lot of work and it's tedious, but I've been told that I should keep it up. It keeps a cool little interest going while nobody's talking or I'm just like hitting the ball. So we're gonna delete all this middle part of this audio because it really doesn't play any part in this because it's all gonna get retimed anyway. So delete this guy out. The only reason why I'm leaving this guy out right here is because it's time to the end, the end card and my end title. So everything ends all nice and smooth. So generally speaking, when I start cleaning up the cut, first thing I'd probably go in and do is take the end elements and I'd move all of them towards the end where they should be, including the scorecard, which we updated last time, as you guys remember. So we'll move all this stuff to the end because we know this is not going to come in until the end of the cut and like there's a subscriber and then here I know this is my end call. So then let's just go in and we can just kind of rework things right here right like the scorecard is obviously going to come before this because we're going to talk and all that fun stuff right so then move this guy back out because that's going to be that last piece there. And then the subscriber actually is going to come forward a little more because the end card has an alpha mat. That comes over the footage that I like, so it comes covering over, and there you go. And there's my end card that comes on, and then the audio that actually matches with it. So I've timed all that out pretty well, so that's why I scoot everything over to the end of the timeline. So that when I start cleaning this stuff up, that'll all stay relatively in the same spot see as I start to take out these gaps all I could do is just hit delete on my keyboard and it's gonna start to move the timeline closer and closer taking out all the gaps so that's actually gonna be my next step so that's what I'd go through and get all those gaps out that signify where my hole is yeah I could have left it in but now I'm starting to tighten up the cut to I want to see like what the duration is gonna be and things like that and then once I get that gone uh, get that done and going I'll adjust the in and out markers so I can use this whole timeline to where I need to edit. And now I'm actually just going to start going in and start matching the graphics to the whole. Uh, I do these things in separate passes so that way I don't get confused too much and see like I have stuff like this and, and things that are still here that shouldn't be here from the previous cut. Let's just take this gift folder out. Sometimes I add gifts when I start saying funny things and I think like I'm trying to be funny, but I'm really not, but continue on. So there you see, I had a little gap that was missing there. So now what I'm gonna probably do is just start from the front and work my way to the end of the clip, end of the cut. So I know I have a lot of these, like this here starts where the actual like um, golf score starts to come up on the right hand side, on the top right of my um, viewfinder. So what I'm gonna do is just cause I know I'm going to need to move all these anyway because they're going to have to go sporadically throughout the cut. I'm just going to take this guy and I'm going to move it out a little more so I can have some room to play with. Because I know the first hole starts over here somewhere. Yeah, see right here. So spread it out pretty far. So I redid the intro so that it has a little bit of entertainment in the beginning. You get me talking and then I threw some B-roll on top of it. A little more talking, introducing the course and stuff like that. And showing off the course, talking about the course a little more. And then I'll let music come in here and play some more B-roll to like some of the stuff that I grabbed from there. And then now introducing me starting to uh, play and stuff. So I love giving these introductions because it's a cool way to introduce yourself, the course, and to get people to like, you know, engage in your videos and all that kind of stuff. So then what's basically going to happen is, is now I'm going to come to the first hole and then I bring in my graphics. I'll adjust the graphic here. So you could see I don't have to do much adjusting, right? It already knows I are, the graphics are already set from the previous video. So my first graphic is going to be whole 10. Now I just had to come back here and relay back to the information and it just so happens to be the 10th starting hole right here is a par 5. So see now I'll have to go in and go into my effects and adjust this to par 5 and I started playing the back 9 as plus 9. Now I just fill in the yardage and stuff too so 44 yards 
And yeah, sometimes I've been like uncapitaling, capitaling things, but you know, I'm, I'm moving so fast sometimes I'm just trying to get through the cut. So there you go, there's that graphic and then it comes on and dictates what I'm doing. And so then I'll bring this next one in, move that further up, do the same thing. If I highlight this video layer here and turn these two off, when I scrub through, it's gonna automatically highlight that clip. So I don't have to keep clicking on it and moving up in here to the essential graphics panel because I already have enough moving I need to do. I wanna try to minimize like what, what I need to do. So here, actually, you know, I'm not even paying attention to the cut. The first drive that I took was actually a mulligan. So this is where I come back out. I know that because I talk so much now, I gotta move these out a little bit so then I can play with it so I don't have to worry about overriding stuff like that. So technically this one as my second shot will be over here somewhere, right? Because this was actually a mulligan ball. So this in here, if I wanna be right, right, I'm gonna call it a mulligan because I didn't technically hit and take that one. I took this drive, right? So that's my first shot, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, Technically seeking it's not but hey, we're, we're playing mulligan rules like that's why we're calling myself the mulligan golfer So then I come in and I got this next graphic that I'm gonna edit down. So it says hole 10 par 5 hitting plus 9 uh, I'm way more than 230 out um, I would say because of the wind that was only about a 200 yard drive. So I say I'm still about like 245 out so this is where I need to kind of improve my cuts This is where I can actually like ha if I had somebody and I said, more more often or not on film, just kept saying, oh, I'm about 280 out. This is what my snap. If I had the ability to do that, I would. But sometimes I'm in, I'm kind of trying to play quick. Obviously, you can tell I'm paired up with people. The next tee time behind us were only 15 minutes. So I got to keep it moving. So I try to do things as much as possible. I'll try to get as much content into these videos as I can and try to be as accurate as possible. But it's tough when you're like a one man team out there kind of trying to do everything. So in essence, I guesstimate a lot of this stuff. Um, club wise, I don't guesstimate. It's pretty obvious like what I'm hitting. So I try to be as accurate as possible in that sense. So here we go. You can pull this next one back. It'll be the next graphic that comes in here. So we just edit this back down again. We're on the same 10th hole, par five plus nine. And I would say from here, um, that three wood shot carried fairly well, uh, but the wind caught it a lot because it was windy. So here, this is how I start guesstimating. So I'm about 90-ish yards out, I would say, given that I'm holding a pitching wedge in my hand. But because I'm in such deep rough, I'm probably a little more than 90 yards. So let's just estimate 100 yards because my average pitching wedge goes about 115, 120. So I'm guesstimating. I'm actually not about 120 yards out. I'm just using the pitching wedge because I'm in the rough. So this is the kind of stuff that I have to do when I'm coming back in here uh, and coming back into editing. You got to have to play like um, one rem remembering is usually the tougher part. So that's why I try to like have to do as less remembering as I possibly can, which includes like doing VO and stuff like that. So you can tell you kind of have you have enough on your plate to do when you come back home to edit these videos and try to get them out on YouTube. So in that sense we just try to kind of keep it as fast as possible so the for the sake of talking through this this is why it's taking me a lot longer but you saw that shot ended up going down that hill on the right and it didn't end up reaching the green luckily it didn't go in the bunker but ended up rolling all the way back down that hill so then we bring our next graphic out here excuse me and this will be our fourth shot so we're Usually I do that four through five when I start doing putting so I don't have to put the graphic up every time I putt So that way you'll see it. Uh, you know, what will be a better thing to do is let's uh, Yeah, let's move this to where we putt and let's just duplicate this one So what I'm doing there is holding option and clicking on that and it duplicates that that layer attribute And so because I have a similar kind of shot here, it's easier to just adjust this to four and then I know I'm using a 56 wedge because I know that's what I use to pitch from where I'm pitching from. And it's probably about 35 yards, right? So this is where you kind of have to play with it a little bit, right? And then now I'm hitting, no, now we come back here and this is where we putt. <laughs> and so this will be a five through six because I got a double bogey on this guy. So five through six and we're putting, we're not putting 75 feet, we're putting about 20 feet. 
I would say. And there you go. And so there's the graphics for that last one, you know? So it, it is a pretty lengthy process, but it is worth it for especially people watching. It gives us some context as to what we're doing, what we're hitting, what we're shooting. So let's, if obviously because I can't show you the whole process, this video would be like two hours long. You got to see the one hole. So that's what I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna implement that across the rest of the cut and I'll be right back. All right, now that we've finished all the overlay graphics to show the right corner graphic that you're seeing right now. Hole 18, par 4, shooting plus 15. Ended up shooting plus 9 on this back 9. Um, so now that we have this graphics laid out, let's zoom out of this timeline here. And come back out. You can see all layer 3 is all the new footage, all timed out. So it's all spaced out now. So it all matches. So it's in the right hole. And it's saying the right information based off of the scorecard that I had. So I just scrub through just to try to show you. So everything works out well. So now we're going to move into the next phase, which is going to be adding the tracers in, uh, which is probably the next um, hardest step, I would say. Um, I mean, not the most tedious and not the hardest, but probably the most time consuming. So with a lot of these, I think it's important to kind of show, like, obviously, I took a mulligan. I'm telling you where it's going but for a lot of people watching this for the first time it'll be hard to follow the ball right so um, I try to put in as many tracers as I can that I think is appropriate to follow the ball um, if I usually hit it straight or it's a good shot I'd leave the tracer off um, I usually add it to all my first tee shots so regardless if it's a part three part four part five on most instances on par five I usually trace the second shot just because it's usually a longer shot so let me show you how to do one and uh, I actually have a tutorial right in here if you if you want to link to it is going to show you exactly how to use these tracers that I'm about to show you and I even gave you a downloaded project if you want to use that too. So I'm going to just do one just as the rest of the video and then I'm just going to tag along and do the rest of, do the rest of them and then jump back into the video to show you what I did as a remainder. So let's just do this first one. So I take that starting point to where it's going to actually hit the ball and I grab it then it hits that tree right there and then it jumps back down. So I need about like that much of the clip. So then jump back to the beginning part of that clip. I'm just going to copy it then move back to After Effects. Okay, so we don't need the scorecard anymore. <clears throat> so now I have these comps open which are already preset in this After Effects file. Again, I have tracer balls, uh, tracer balls, tracers set for like 17 different comps. When I first started, I did tracers for almost every shot. Then it got really too like demanding to do. So ended up honing it down to just doing the tee box shot. So then what we do is just, let's decollapse this so that we can add our footage into the right folder when it starts getting too much. Is cut, we're gonna paste that in there. So obviously you can't see the layer, so I'm gonna hit left bracket to bring that out. And I'm gonna hit O as the out point, then N to close that off, and then there's my ending point for the render. Then I just push, push these keyframes back so it matches the length of where it goes. And basically, cause this one's kind of like a goof shot, I'm just gonna edit this curve so it matches what happens so people kind of get an idea so i'm going to hit home on the keyboard i'm going to hold on to command and then move this cursor to the dot right here then obviously i know it hits the branch over here somewhere so then we just put that over there and then we put the last point like over here because it lands uh it, i don't even think it lands i think it literally hits off the, the tree and jumps all the way over into like this part of the the bushes so I, I tried looking for it but it was not findable um, yeah see it hit impact like right there and then it jumps off pretty heavily but yeah anyways now you get the concept so then like what I would do is because this is a line drive right I would I would bend this one because that's what happened right so it kind of just like right <laughs> so it doesn't actually make a curve it just kind of hit so then what we can do, we delete, I don't know why I'll bring in audio all the time, but you can delete that layer out. Now bring this one above it and then you can see like the arc that it does, right? And then it hits. So it hit the tree relatively. That we could bring this back, so. And so it doesn't have to be perfect, but you get the you get the idea of what happened. Then I just turn this guy off, come back to the home marker. 
uh, I'm holding Control Command M, which brings it into my render queue. And I have this handy little um, preset already set there. Then I just have to navigate to where I'm lovely. Need to drop this guy. And we are doing back nine tracers. So I hit save and then I hit export. They export out fairly quickly, right? So then I set myself up back when I need to come back in After Effects. Then right here, got all these nice handy folders ready for everything too. So I import, go back to where I saved it, import that. And the good thing is, is it always matches because our cuts always match. And there's your first tracer, right? So that's how you do it. Now I'm going to do that for the rest of the cut. So let me just do that really quickly and we'll jump back into the rest of the video. We're almost there. Well, a couple more steps and I think we should be good. And then should, we should be able to close out the video. Now that we've finished <coughs> all the tracers on this back nine, acting as a front nine or acting as a first video, I finished the last tracer on here. A lot of these tracers, my drives were right in front of me. So it's not really getting like the actual like arc that you wanted. And I was stinging out most of the time because of the wind. Um, so ended up finishing all of them. So I got all my tracers down here on video two above all the other ones. So now at this point, basically what I would do and, oh, and I got to mix down some of the audio. I didn't actually mix it down yet because for the sake of this video, I'll have some touching up to do for this video anyways, before I release it. But because of the tutorial sake, I just put the audio down there so you can see that it's filled, but I'll go in and further tweak it so that I can uh, increase and decrease the levels at certain times where it needs to be. Um, but other than that, uh, the cut is pretty much there um, without uh, making some small tweaks and adjustments to it. I would then actually probably just watch it one time through again just to make sure everything is there. So kind of quality checking everything to make sure everything is okay. So like for instance, like, yeah, see, so stuff like this didn't actually edit this title. So this is actually going to be episode 31, 32, right? Yep. And then this edits to, uh, yo, and, uh, we'll just put cash Creek. I feel like that's where it is. So see, making adjustments like this and stuff like that. So actually adjusting everything and making sure everything is right. And then adding all my subscribe um, icon, um, graphics in to make sure that I get it in the front and back of the video. I got the end card there and I end with my logo and everything. So it's ending. I mean, it's getting pretty close to exporting. So it feels like that would have been my next step is to just export this cut. Um, given that if I watched it one time already through, added some other secondary graphics that I like to add sometimes uh, in certain areas. So that's why I like to watch it through. At this point, I would probably just let it export and I'm done with Premiere for, for, for now. <laughs> um, then I would jump back over here to Illustrator and start getting the thumbnails ready good still frame to use I think that's great so let's do that and I'm gonna browse to my latest project and I'm gonna go into thumbnails and I have this folder here where I keep the images for the thumbnail specifically and this is gonna be 066 so I know the video that it's gonna go in there then I'd come in here and I'd replace out the image Thumbnails is something that I have preset as well. The designs actually come from something that I had uh, done in the uh, previous stages earlier this year. I wanted to kind of templatize everything. So I'm just going to take this moment to kind of go that, go over that. So here's my version three of graphics. I have thumbnails pretty much set up for every aspect of the view of YouTube videos that I'm going to have uh, some that even have carousels to add other aspects of uh, my video too like I do a lot of cooking videos with my mom so we haven't started that back up yet but the golf one we've been using pretty heavily uh, I have portfolio stuff that kind of goes up here and there um, you can see like I kind of designed it so I can lay it out as a carousel on Instagram and other social aspects Then I have the tutorial one which you'll see for this one um, which I'm going to use so I kind of just designed everything so I can have it pretty much plug and play everything's ready to go uh, we did the same thing with all the graphics too I redesigned all the graphics and after effects for the end cards and then pre-rendered them so a lot of the graphics that I have are all pre-rendered graphics so it's working out pretty seamless to do this fairly easily so once I got these thumbnails all ready to go, I'll usually have them right here in the renders folder with the other renders for the videos. 
So at this stage, you're pretty much ready to go. Once you get these thumbnails exported, it would actually come right here to this renders folders where I would put all my stuff. So you would see six images, uh, three for the front nine, three for the back nine, and then the two final renders from the project. And there you go. And that would be what it takes for me to put out one of these set of videos for a golf course. I know it sounds like a lot, um, to be honest, it is a lot, but it takes a lot of pre-planning. And if you have the pre-planning ready to go, it makes it a lot easier. So for example, I'm not showing you the right one, but here's a good example of the scripts that I kind of write out. So now that I'm ready and I have my final renders and everything's ready to go, it's been quality checked, all my spelling is correct, everything, blah, blah, blah. Now I just come in here and I just get to copy and paste this just like this. And there's the description ready to go in YouTube. So it's not too much, like not too much that you have to reinvent the wheel with this. It's like once you get a good streamline going, it makes it super easy to get really get done. And uh, so with this, it's very easy. So I don't have to sit there and write out stuff. I kind of just do it before the project starts and it's ready to go. I even templatized all these. So based on the type of project that I'm doing, cooking with Debbie, golf, tutorial, um, it all has different copy it all has different tags it all has different content that's there so like i have download links in some then i have uh like patches to other playlists and stuff so anything that you have it's easy to just copy and paste it and it creates a faster workflow for me at least so which kind of brings me to um my last thing that i wanted to show was when i'm kind of done and wrapped up uh one of the reasons why i keep all these separated by whole is Right here, you'll see a sequence uh, called per hole. So I'll change this one because now I'm gonna do this one for Yoke Dihi. And what I do is put these per hole ones, you can see the orientation for this composition is different. See, it's, it's for TikTok. So what I generally do is I take this first hole and I take out all the talking out of it. So it's literally just per shot you're seeing at shot for shot and I post that on TikTok. So um, what I usually do is I just copy and paste the footage from here and then I rescale it and, and, and make sure that it looks clean enough to use. And uh, this composition is 900 by 1600. So it's not full scale uh, uh, mobile, but it works out to be clear enough and it doesn't like stretch enough to where it doesn't look warped. So that's usually, that's one of the biggest reasons why I, I keep this separated because it helps me from not having to go through all the footage again. So I just get to come here, copy and paste it. And then I just do unlink scale to frame size and there you go. And it's pretty much there. So if I click on this last one and I go to effect controls, I usually scale it down because if you come down to 75%, it actually looks even nicer. So, and there you go. Now I have uh, my content all for TikTok. So I can literally create 18 videos for TikTok specifically from the same repurposed GoPro footage that I shot, which I'm creating the other videos for. So <laughs> it's a lot of overlap that you can do. And there's a lot of stuff that you can actually like recycle to actually use onto your other social platforms. You can even take it a step further and do Instagram. I try to not do it because you don't get that kind of engagement on Instagram. It's more image heavy. So I leave the video stuff for TikTok and YouTube. So if you haven't followed me already onto YouTube or TikTok or any of them, like, comment, subscribe. I have links to my TikTok and my, on my page. So make sure you click on that. And if you have any questions about anything, man, comment. Uh, I went over the gear and what I shoot with in a previous video in my last tutorial. So, but if you have any questions on that, I'm happy to answer it too. It's nothing much. I just go out there with the GoPro and, and a like cheap little Amazon stand. And that's pretty much it. Um, so I hope this was helpful, especially to those who are actually creating content in this COVID time, just like me. Um, I have done this a little longer on the post-production side of things. So like the filming and editing kind of came natural. Um, so happy to answer any questions. And if I stream through stuff and you were like, whoa, what'd you do? Just comment and I'm happy to answer it. So hopefully this pipeline or workflow works for other people and it can make it a little easier. I know this can be daunting, but it can also be fun at the same time. So if you find that good balance and that good pipeline, it makes it easy. And with me, you see, I use Adobe for everything. So they talk, the, the programs work together fairly seamlessly and I usually have not that many problems and it's not that expensive anymore. You can sign up for it for like a very cheap cost. So, um, yeah, with that, thank you guys for watching again, like comment, subscribe. And if you have any questions, 
I'm happy to answer it. Happy golfing, guys. Peace out.